impact network that is ungc dr chobe has done his phd in environmental engineering from iit delhi he has made a unique position in corporate world by embedding sustainability and reducing the environmental footprint of big corporates he is expert in environmental impact assessment and life cycle assessment he is also a member of bureau of indian standards for making bis standard for water and wastewater treatment and environmental protection he is also an author of a renowned book wastewater treatment technologies design consideration published by wiley publisher usa and a speaker at un water conference recently he has been awarded with most influential sustainability leader award chief sustainability officer of the year award asian sustainable leadership award and top 20 sustainability leader award sir we are extremely fortunate to have you today as a speaker uh, the session would be of an hour followed by a q and a session for last 10 minutes and then we can wrap up the session so over to you sir thank you thank you so am i audible yes sir yes sir yes, very much so good evening to all of you uh, this is my second session with uh, indian institute of forest management bhopal uh, in this session we will uh, discuss corporate management model of sustainability so corporate management model for sustainability uh, here we will i i shall like to share um, my experience uh, because i am with corporate from last 25 year uh, leading sustainability in various organization uh, right now i am at upl so upl is fifth largest uh, agrochemical company of the world our presence is in 137 uh, countries and uh, i am heading here globally environment and sustainability before this i was a sustainability global in charge of unilever and uh, before unilever i was at uh, netherland in uh, oil company cell so i was looking sustainability of cell before cell i was with pentair uh, one of the us multinational company so i shall share with you uh, my experience uh, in sustainability and how to embed sustainability how to manage sustainability in the corporate especially manufacturing industries because sustainability is very challenging in manufacturing plants there you have to see uh, not only um, uh, social angle not only you have to see the Uh, dimension of environment but also you have to see the economic dimension and uh, you have to balance between the uh, economic dimension social dimension and environment dimension and actually that is the sustainability because in in sustainability we try to see that how we can balance among economic interest social interest and the environmental interest and uh, those company or those corporate who able to balance among all these three dimensions economic environment and social then they considered that uh, yes they are driving sustainability well and uh, sustainability is for the profitability of uh, organization and uh, from last uh, Uh, maybe this sustainability came in picture uh, mainly in the corporate after 2005 so after 2005 a lot of discussion and, uh, and discussion starts happening on sustainability and uh, after 2015 paris agreement on climate change uh, it's it's again gained up so after 2015 you can see that uh, more and more corporate uh, start announcing uh, agenda on the sustainability and the uh, 
various organization start naming chief sustainability officer and one of the very important aspect of any corporate is sustainability report so that now you will see that day by day uh, it's gaining momentum and uh, every year it's increasing exponential sustainability reporting so that is a very important part also the another important part which is gaining momentum in sustainability is uh, science based target so now you will find that more and more corporates are getting their science based target validated and approved by un initiated sbti so i think in this presentation we will cover all those things let me share my presentation and then uh, we will start so actually i am habituated okay from here it's i am habituated with the team meeting so let us see here how it goes this is google meet no yes, yes sir mm -hmm. yes i think now it will get share is it coming yeah it is it is there yes 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 so good so in uh, my presentation uh, i shall cover mainly i shall start with a slight introduction on sustainability but i know that the audience are uh, aware with the basic of sustainability and esg so just i have covered one slide and uh, then i shall cover corporate management model for sustainability and uh, i shall also talk about the international sustainability rating agency so the, that is very important uh, international sustainability rating nowadays in corporate if we able to get good rating from the sustainability rating agency like uh, dow jones sustainability index uh, cdp sustainalytics uh, ftc russell so these all are the leading international uh, either say sustainability or esg rating agency and uh, if you get good rating then uh, you will get a lot of benefit like you can attract investor you can attract talent uh, you you can also get socially more acceptable your brand image get enhanced so i shall cover three four important rating agency then i shall also talk about science based targets and uh, last i shall cover on environmental reforms needed because uh, the students which uh, pursuing the study at uh, indian institute of forest management tomorrow they will go in the field maybe some corporate some government some consulting firm so they should understand that what kind of environmental reform at this moment corporate want to enhance the production and especially if you see our ambitious program of our prime minister narendra modi to make 5 trillion economy india economy uh, by 2025 so long back this slogan was given but if we want to make 5 trillion economy then we need to do certain environmental reform also uh, such that we can able to manufacture at a higher uh, growth rate so i shall cover and then i shall conclude so is it okay or your your expectation or some other topic also need to be get covered i think it's perfectly fine okay okay fine so this is about uh, our company upl so i am at uh, upl limited and uh, i am heading globally environment sustainability so just one slide about the upl we are fifth largest crop protection company globally 
and uh, we are also logo holder of responsible care and ftac for good so very few company are the logo holder of responsible care very few companies are logo holder of ftac for good so those company whose sustainability rating happens to be very good and they have embedded all the best practices of environment management they only get this logo so this logo is with upl our presence is in more than 138 countries and um, uh, we are committed upl is committed to have carbon neutrality by 2040 so if you see uh, paris agreement on climate change they are talking carbon neutrality by 2050 and uh, we have committed in public domain uh, 10 year earlier by 2040 the upl will be carbon neutral globally so that is our commitment and based upon that commitment uh, we have set our science based target and uh, our science based target is validated and approved by un initiated sbti so that's about the upl now you can see here uh, a small introduction to sustainability and uh, esg uh, so it uh, slide is moving or it's not moving okay it's moving so here um, uh, uh, if you see either sustainability or esg then mainly we talk about the three dimension one is environment dimension another is social dimension and third is governance dimension and under environmental dimension you can see environmental reporting environment management system uh, operation eco efficiency uh, product stewardship biodiversity climate change and water related risk those things get covered under environment and uh, at corporate mainly you, you may have gone through your curriculum all those things but uh, in any manufacturing plant it's become very important and it's not easy task to report on all uh, on all these things so you have to make the mechanism where all the environmental data you need to track from your operation and then on annual basis you have to do reporting on all these aspects so what at upl we have done we have created our in-house sustainability data tracker so one software we have made and uh, daily basis that software collect the information from the 41 operating plants globally so more or less approximately 50 uh, so some two three plants uh, plus minus it's happen on year basis but you can say roughly that 50 manufacturing plant who all are situated around the globe we capture with in-house sustainability data tracker and the all information that how much water get consumed how much production happen how much energy get consumed so what all source of energy is because it is very important to have the carbon footprint so you should must know the source of energy whether it is a grid whether it is coal whether it is renewable because everyone have different factor and how much waste get generated uh, so all the data there are n number of data which need to be reported at the corporate level centralized software and and then we report in form of sustainability report at annual basis uh, now i am not going to detail on all these things because then it will take much more time and i think it is included in your curriculum so you are well aware also then go to the social dimension uh, social dimension is also very important for sustainability but here the people get confused they confuse that social means csr mostly uh, corporate nowadays there is a confusion that i am doing the charity work or i am doing the csr activity so that is the social but it is not in the sustainability 
and especially if you see our international sustainability rating agency uh, like uh, djsi or sustainalytics or cdp or ftse for uh, ftse russell uh, they don't consider those things while giving the good rating even though your csr activity is very good you are doing a lot of charity but you will end with the very poor a uh, score why because under social they try to see that how good is your hr practices so how you are taking care of your employee and safety is very important how the organization is dealing occupational health and safety so that is very important under the social talent attraction retention so what is your attrition rate if your company attrition rate is very high then they uh, provide poor rating and under sustainability we don't consider that company as a sustainable company and uh, customer uh, relationship management so how you are conducting customer satisfaction index and how your cu customer satisfaction index is good so i think those things are uh, very important under social dimension now third dimension is governance and governance dimension is also very important and uh, approximately 35% weightage given to governance so mainly you can see that the 33% average 33% uh, environment 33% social 33% governance and year over year sometimes 1 2% here or there uh, agency used to set so like this year DJSI said 33% environment, 32% weightage to social, and 35% weightage to governance. But year over year, they go on changing 1-2% here and there. So you can say that broadly, all these three dimensions given equal weightage while calculating the uh, score of, uh, of sustainability and uh, or ESG. Somebody say ESG rating, somebody sustainability, so same thing. Under governance, you can see corporate governance, materiality, risk and crisis management, uh, business ethics, uh, information and cyber security. Cyber security is nowadays very important and uh, that used to get discussed and uh, company uh, means we used to see that uh, whether your company have ISO 27001 certification or no if one company have iso 27001 certification it means they have very good um, cyber security and the it practices and innovation management this is also considered under governance and innovation management is a very important for the company so I think this is uh, just a summary and the brief about ESG or sustainability. Now going forward, um, I am going to show you just one uh, survey. This uh, ERM long back, they have conducted one survey that what is the top motivations for sustainability. And you can see here in 2019, when they conducted survey among corporate, this survey was among corporate only. So uh, they selected uh, several companies globally and they do the survey that uh, uh, what is the top motivation for sustainability. So broadly four criteria came in. One is the people prefer sustainability for brand and reputation. Second is People prefer sustainability for improved long-term return. Third is people prefer sustainability for decreased investment risk. And fourth is external stakeholder requirement. So this is the four things are very prominent. And among these four, if you see, then in 2019, maximum 52% Corporate used to say that they adopt sustainability because of improved long-term return. So till 2019, 
कॉर्पोरेट थॉट प्रोसेस वाज दैट वी प्रिफर सस्टेनेबिलिटी और ईएसजी व्हाई बिकॉज इट विल इंप्रूव आवर लॉन्ग टर्म रिटर्न बट इन 2021 देयर वाज अ सरप्राइज एंड इन सर्वे इट्स केम दैट नाउ द माइंडसेट ऑफ कॉर्पोरेट हैज चेंज्ड एंड इन 2021 इट्स केम that uh, 59% corporate start thinking ki our top motivation for sustainability is brand and reputation improvement so they want to embed sustainability because they feel that sustainability improve the brand and reputation and and this is a major change came in 2021 and today also if you see then this figure is more than 59% and uh, brand and reputation has overtaken return as the main esg drive now coming to uh, corporate management model for sustainability and uh, this is the main agenda of today our discussion and uh, in this uh, one slide i have included a lot of things and um, if we say corporate management model for sustainability means we have to see how global goals are of that corporate then the second important thing is global reporting third is global certification and fourth is global ratings so any corporate if it's working from multi locations multi country then it's very important that first they should set their sustainability goal and target uh, based upon global requirement and uh, second is their reporting should be global they should must meet the global criteria and third is they should must have certification global certifications and fourth is they should must have good international rating in sustainability so you can see here we will see one by one uh, first part is global goals so for any corporate it's very important first to set the sustainability goal and target and sustainability goals and targets always set from top to down so first at board level company used to set the sustainability goal and target and then it's percolated to bottom and finally the organization achieve it and what's important while setting the sustainability goal is that the company sustainability goal and target must be aligned with sdg it must aligned with paris agreement on climate change and it must aligned with science based target so three things are very important while setting the sustainability goal and target one is sdg so there are 17 sdg and uh, our sdg must be aligned with our sustainability goal and target if you see upl then at upl when we set our sustainability goal and target in 2016 then we identified five priority sdg and among 17 sdg we have identified five priority sdg for the upl and then we set four sustainability target and goal and those four sustainability goal and targets are fully aligned with sdg similarly paris agreement on climate change so they are you must your sustainability goal must uh, be aligned with the decarbonization plan so if your sustainability goal is not talking about the paris agreement on climate change if it's not talking about the decarbonization plan then uh, it, it it's not uh, aligned with the global standard of sustainability goal 
so it must be aligned with the paris uh, agreement on climate change similarly uh, sustainability goals should be must align with the science based target and uh, i don't know how of you know detail about science based target but uh, uh, if those people who know it's very good if those who doesn't know then just go and search it nowadays it's very easily available on website and uh, science based target is a very important uh, to achieve the carbon neutrality and the main important is that uh, the paris agreement on climate change ways that we should follow the 1.5 degree celsius trajectory and um, if you want to follow the 1.5 degree celsius trajectory then you have to set your decarbonization plan as per that and that's about the science based target going forward one or two slide i shall cover about the science based target uh, so second part is global reporting so global reporting means our sustainability report uh, it should must be reported in a public domain on the annual basis and it should must aligned with the gri standard it should must aligned with the ungc united nation global compact so i don't know how many of you know about uh, ungc united nation global compact but uh, those people who doesn't know i shall request that go and search there is a website united nations global compact is a very important organization initiated by united nations and its main activity is to motivate and promote uh, among corporates to achieve the paris agreement on climate change and nowadays uh, ungc is doing a lot of work to decrease the carbon emission of world and um, uh, for me uh, i am also associated with the ungc our uh, upl is member of uh, ungc and we have signed that we will adhere with 10 basic principle of ungc and every year in our sustainability report if you see we index and we report every year that how we are adhere with the 10 basic principle of ungc and recently uh, i have been elected as a governing member of uh, united nation Glo global compact network india so at this moment uh, i am governing council member of uh, uh, united nation global compact network india so so i am associated with ungc a uh, third thing is tcfd report so our reporting must be aligned with the tcfd now uh, third important thing is global certifications and you can see here i have mainly if you see sustainability then uh, ftse for good responsible care certification and uh, tfs together for sustainability this is also one certification and if these three happen uh, have uh, in any organization it means uh, uh, they are pursuing sustainability very well and fourth part is a global rating so under global rating there are a lot of international uh, sustainability rating agency and they rate the organization every year and provide the rating uh, but if you ask from me that globally uh, very renowned est rating agency <coughs> then i can see first is the djsi dow jones sustainability index uh, they are from the switzerland head office ftse russell from the london stock exchange and sustainalytics is a premier est rating agency from netherlands so these three are and, and fourth i have not shown here but cdp cdp is also equally important from the uk so these three four international rating agency you apply and uh, i hope that uh, in your course you may have seen that how the, the practice happens to be for this rating agency 
how they ask question uh, and information on environment dimension, social dimension, and governance dimension. And then finally, they rate the organization. And this rating is very important. If your organization have very good rating from this sustainability rating agency, then you will get very easily green loan. Nowadays, green loan are very prevalent, green loan, green bond. So corporates are utilizing that benefit. At UPL, uh, we have taken green loan, 1.5 billion US dollars. Uh, and uh, that is linked with our sustainability performance. So another uh, advantage of good sustainability rating is that you can attract investors. So nowadays, FII, so foreign investors are investing in those companies uh, whose international rating is very good as far as sustainability is concerned or ESG is concerned. You can attract a very good talent um, because here uh, I think all of you will love to work with those companies which uh, ESG uh, score is very good or sustainability score is very good. So those things are the benefit of having very good global ratings for sustainability. So I think uh, uh, this is the summary about sustainability management framework. Now I shall take you uh, uh, some of the uh, practical data that uh, when you apply the sustainability framework, then uh, what is right now position and and actually this survey is conducted by my group at upl so we have taken the data from the public domain and you can see first uh, i have shown that on what framework we have found that how much percentage company have qualified and uh, sustainability reporting is one criteria that how many companies have a sustainability report in public domain. Second is a, a scope three emission. So if you see emissions, then there happens to be three emission, a scope one, a scope two, a scope three. A scope one and two, everyone uh, used to calculate and report. But a scope three emission is very difficult and very few organizations used to disclose. So I have captured that how many companies have disclosed a scope three emissions. Then third criteria is science-based target commitment. So how many have uh, science-based target uh, commitment and approved SBTI? And uh, then the TCFD reporting and carbon neutrality commitment. And you can see the data. The first uh, is a responsible care logo holder companies in India. So, you know, uh, if any company is having responsible care logo, it means it is a very good company. <coughs> and uh, they have done very good practices. So, why responsible care logo has been given to that company? And my expectation was that when we will apply this sustainability framework, then they will qualify 100%. Because if your company is responsible care, then you should must report sustainability report in public domain. You must disclose all the emission. Your, 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 you must have the science-based target approved. You must have report TCFT report. You must commit the carbon neutrality. So our expectation was that the responsible care company in India must have 100% qualified. And today, if you see UPL, UPL, then UPL qualify 100% in all these. We have sustainability report. We have disclosure scope 3 emission. We have SBTI approved our size-based target. We have TCFT report. We have committed carbon neutrality for 2040. But here, the if you see the survey of all responsible care company of India, then you will see that only 44% RC company have sustainability report assured by third party. We found a scope 3 emission, only 
RC company have disclosed a scope three emission. On science based target, we found only 15% RC company have committed science based target. TCFD reporting <coughs> only 14% RC companies have released a TCFD report. And on carbon neutrality, only 14%, one four, 14% RC company have committed carbon neutrality. So I think this, this surprises me and um, we have to do a lot of work to achieve the 100% and uh, at least responsible care companies should must be 100% in all these parameters. Now the second thing you can see, uh, forget about the RC company, now see the nifty 50 listed company. So if you see our stock exchange and nifty 50 means top 50 listed company of India and they considered very good and even their situation is not very good. Among Nifty 50 company, only 68% have reported sustainability report, only 44% have disclosed a scope 3 emission, only 12% have set science-based target, only 24% have disclosed TCFD report. And only 10% Nifty 50 company have committed carbon neutrality. So I think here you can get a flavor that how more and more works are required in India uh, to achieve the sustainability framework. Now this is about international sustainability rating agencies. So as I told you in beginning that there are several rating agencies, but I shall talk about DJSI, CDP, Sustainalytics, FTSE, Russell, and why? Because you can see here, um, uh, as far as number of respondent is concerned, more than 15,000 plus respondent, only three rating agencies have, DJSI, CDP, Sustainalytics, and FTSE Russell have 7,500. And if you see the other rating agency, then they their respondent will be even less than 7,500. So, so we have considered those companies who have more and more participants in, in, in their indexing process. Then data quality, uh, data usefulness, uh, and uh, participation fee also you can see DJSI is free and uh, FTSC Russell is free and CDP and Sustainalytics charge a small amount of uh, fee. Uh, so, so this is about all these rating agency. Now come to the science-based target. Uh, uh, still, uh, how much time I have? Then I, I think I, I, say, uh, I shall go faster. We have around 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, so the well, session gets interesting it can be definitely stretched for 10 15 minutes absolutely no problem and for question and answer how much uh, you need uh, 10 minutes we have kept for q a okay okay so maybe in another 20 minute i shall conclude my presentation is it fine yes, sir. sure okay. yes sir. okay so uh, this is about science based target and uh, this I have included purposely because uh, all the uh, students who are passing out from the Indian Institute of Forest Management, they should must aware that uh, science-based target is very important. And wherever they go, they, they should try to see that their organization have set the science-based target. And uh, science-based target is uh, initiated by UN uh, United Nations Global Compact. And there are four partners in uh, SBTI, CDP, uh, UNGC, and um, uh, World WRI, and WWF. And uh, this is at international level, uh, SBTI is an organization. You will have a dedicated website. And uh, year over year, the companies uh, are increasing who have set their science-based target. And uh, if you see the process, the process is a very, very, uh, means it takes two years for any company to 
<coughs> first commit and then their science based target get validated and approved by SVTI. Why I am saying? Because at UPL, uh, we have taken two year time to qualify for the uh, our science based target get approved by SBTI. So what we did or any company, first you have to do the commitment. So your top company official, mainly CEO of the company, they should must in writing send a commitment letter to SBTI <coughs> that we are committed for the science based target. And then SBTI provides two year window that in two year window, you set your science based target. And then the development of science based target starts. And here what's happened, the main difficult task is that at SBTI, uh, 15, 20 experts happen and they ask all the emission data. So you have to submit a scope one emission, you have to submit a scope two emission, <coughs> and you have to submit a scope three emission. And a scope three emission is a very difficult one because there are 15 category, all the raw material which you are taking, their carbon emission also you have to submit, which is not in your control all the upper stream down a stream uh, transportation and the business activity so there are 15 broader category and all those category emission calculation is not easy task and once you submit the scope one scope two scope three emission then they start validation process so there will be several round of discussion and they will go by each and every data that how you have calculated, what is the justification, how you arrived on this. At UPL, since I was leading the uh, all this process, so we have approximately 14 round of discussion. First round discussion happened, we convinced something. Then again, second round, they asked some, then third. For, like 14 round discussion happen with SBTI. And then finally, at end of two year, we get our science-based target approved and validated as well. So this is the process. And once you submit the right uh, data, then the, they, they will approve, they will, they will validate it and approve the science-based target. And then the company can do the communication that our target is validated and approved and then they can disclose in the public domain. Uh, here you can see the example, this is the UPL SBTI certificate. So how uh, SBTI used to give the science-based target approval certificate, you can see here, uh, this is for the UPL. And um, one small information I have included that uh, a scope one, a scope two, a scope three emission, which get approved by the SBTI. So here you, you will surprise that how the percentage is. A scope one is 19% of total emission. A scope two is just 5% of total emission. And our a scope three emission is 76% of our total emission. So that's how our emissions are uh, uh, among one, two, and three category. Now, uh, last, I shall talk about the environmental reforms needed uh, to make five trillion economy. And um, here you can see, mainly I shall cover at this moment for a corporate, especially manufacturing plant, what I feel that uh, we need certain reform at uh, environment clearance and uh, we need certain reform regarding uh, our deep sea discharge standards and third is the ZLD. So what I feel that uh, if you see today environment clearance process, then it's very complicated and it's take so much time, three, four year time sometimes it's take. 
and corporate is ready to adopt all the practices but they don't want delay because if it's take three year time then the project get delayed so they want faster what we can do uh, we can move all the notified industrial uh, state industry from category a to category b2 and then the environment clearance will be faster and the example is uh, during the corona for pharma company <coughs> the government has done it the moment we have moved pharma company from a to b2 category then the environment clearance happens faster and uh, any notified industrial estate before bringing they go for the environment clearance of entire industrial estate so there is no logic that uh, once the environment clearance is granted to entire industrial estate, then every industry do the detail uh, EIA. <coughs> so I think moving from A category to B2 will be very good. And similarly, um, you can see here uh, on deep sea discharge. So deep sea discharge, actually we need to align our uh, standard with the international uh, standards. At this moment, uh, whatever the norm for the river discharge, the same norm is applicable for the deep sea discharge. But if you go in US and if you see US EPA norm, then their standard is different. Different for the river discharge and different for the deep sea discharge. Uh, whereas in India, we have applied both for the same. And uh, what uh, problem is coming? One is the carbon emission. So if you have applied a stringent condition for the deep sea discharge also, then uh, treating effluent consume more energy, approximately five times more energy. And so five times more carbon emission happen. So uh, actually it's required detailed discussion. I have given brief in this presentation you can see one book, uh, Wastewater Treatment Technology Design Consider uh, Considerations. <coughs> so that book has been authored by me and it is published by Wiley. And uh, there I have uh, included a detailed chapter about deep sea discharge. And uh, if you read that, then you will get a lot of flavor. Uh, from that book only, I have summarized some result that what is the standard for the deep sea discharge in India and what is the standard in, in the USA EPA. So you can see clearly mismatch and um, we feel that we should align our standard with the US EPA standard. Uh, third thing is the about the ZLD, zero liquid discharge. So on ZLD also, uh, we feel that uh, everywhere we should not make it mandatory. If uh, uh, coastal area, if the coastal area have good deep sea discharge, then uh, it's not environment friendly <coughs> to achieve the zero liquid discharge. Because while achieving zero liquid discharge, we end with consuming more and more energy and more carbon emission happen. Uh, more uh, hazardous waste get generated, uh, which uh, create uh, uh, more load on the landfill sites. And also it's not economical. Capital and operating costs are also very high. So you can see in this table that uh, how the power consumption is four times higher in JDLD than normal ETP. Carbon emission is four times higher in JDLD than normal ETP. Solid waste generation is two times higher than normal ETP. Chemical consumption in JLD is two times higher than normal ETP. Capital cost 2.5 times higher and operating cost three times higher in uh, uh, JLD as compared to the normal ETP to meet the discharge standard. So I have also published one uh, technical paper from Indian Chemical Council. You can see here. So that paper elaborate very well about this. And uh, in my book also, I have covered one, uh, one chapter on JLD. 
so i think uh, this is also a need of our that the government agency should look into this and they should uh, also don't make mandatory jld uh, jld everywhere and uh, this is uh, about some of the data that uh, how much power consumption needed per cubic meter of wastewater treated etp to meet us epa norm and how much power consumption is uh, to meet a uh, india norm and how much power consumption is required to meet the jld norm and you can see clearly that how much difference is there and because of that we talk that we we should must do the alignment with the international norms of india norm and this is the last slide then i shall end with my presentation and uh, this is the last about uh, this is about the message that without sustainable agriculture no sustainable world is possible and uh, since our company is um, in uh, agrochemical and we are very much associated with the agriculture and farmers so we formally believe that without sustainable agriculture no sustainable world is possible and why we are saying because uh, you can see that what is the data on forest what is data on food and what is data on farmers and uh, here what this data is showing that uh, deforestation is happening and why deforestation are happening because there is a pressure to feed the world and if we want to feed the world then we have to adopt sustainable technology and sustainable way of farming so that is need of our then only we, we will able to protect the forest the summary of this is this that uh, agriculture and forest uh, accounts 30 percent of the climate solution but they receive less than three percent climate finance so this is the worldwide mismatching when it comes for the climate finance, then world community is financing less than 3%. But if you see the agriculture and forest provide more than 30% solution to the climate problem and climate issue. So what we feel that the world community should allocate right climate budget to the agriculture and forest as well if it's provide more than 30 percent solution then the climate budget should be also for the agriculture and forest approximately 30 percent it should not be less than three percent so this is the message in this presentation uh, and with that um, i shall conclude now open to question and sir Thank you so much, sir, for this informative presentation. So um, I request Deb Jyoti to unmute and you can ask the question. Okay, I'm just uh, stopping sharing. So, okay. Yes. Now you can go for the question, sir. If Jyoti is not able to ask, then possibly Satrishi can begin. Uh, he also has a hand raised. Unmute yourself, Satrishi. Yes, yes. Am I, am I audible, sir? Yes. Yes, yes. Good afternoon, sir. First of all, <laughs> thank, thank you for being with us. And greetings from the IFM family. Uh, you have just mentioned in your presentation that uh, like a software is keeping track of sustainability at UPL right now and uh, keeping in mind about the like recent AI development and revolution do you find that sustainability professionals will even be relevant to the industry or we are already fighting a losing war that's that's my first question sir and uh, the second question uh, I would uh, like to say that um, you have already spearheaded the preparation of the water master plan of LNG project and refineries while working for Shale in Amsterdam back in 2006 if I'm not wrong and uh, can you please elaborate about their recent backtracking and like greenwashing tendencies regarding the sustainability issues? Because in 2022, even Shell produced nearly 504 million barrels of crude oil and LNG. So, don't you think companies like them or Exxon Mobil even still not questionable in terms of sustainability? And like, how can we tackle these kind of issues? 
right so i think uh, your uh, these two questions are very valid question but yes the answer is also lying in your question uh, coming to your first and then come on the second first your question about the sustainability data tracker and then your apprehension that whether the sustainability professional will be relevant or they will find more opportunity because of sustainability data tracker there will be job loss this is your question yes yes sir yes so uh, see uh, i am in this profession and uh, we have developed sustainability data tracker in house at ups and whatever my team is before this data tracker we hired more people after bringing the data tracker actually uh, we should not uh, see that uh, there is a conflict between human employment and the advancement in the technology and i can give you only example then when i was in a school maybe in uh, um, uh, in 9 1984 85 at that time rajiv gandhi became prime minister of india and 85 i happens to be in delhi school in cbsc i was reading and we were getting a lot of hue cry that rajiv gandhi was pursuing that let's bring computer in india and uh, opposition was saying and making hue cry that uh, when computer will come then there will be unemployment and uh, at that time uh, i was in a school so we also think like that it is very bad if computer will come then there will be unemployment but today see how computer have changed the face of entire world including india and how much uh, extra employment get generated today i feel that uh, because of computer and it maximum employment is coming from the it sector tcs infosys and all these company have taken a lot of so i think same way i can say that uh, this sustainability data tracker or the technology they enable the people to do and and human being cannot be replaced by all these things and sustainability professionals will even find more and more employment because of this because when the people will start implementing this data tracker then it is the sustainability professional who will make this data tracker who will run this data tracker and uh, who will make applicable in the company so i think there is a no threat and uh, absolutely no threat and uh, even it will enhance the sustainability professional employment second thing to your question sell so i have worked at cell so some time back i happens to be employee of cell company and there also the apprehension work when i joined cell at amsterdam then during introduction talk they given me uh, like all company they given me t-shirt and one bag of cell and on my t-shirt cell logo was there and on my computer bag cell logo was there and uh, i like it because that logo is very beautiful beautiful but what uh, cell people told me during introduction that while traveling internationally at airport don't bear t-shirt don't carry this bag so then we ask why then they told us sometimes some protest happens some people used to attack also when they see that you are a cell employee or bearing cell logo so why uh, i asked then they told me that there are several ngo they do the protest because we are doing the oil exploration we are in the fuel business so they but see here my answer is this that uh, actually uh, uh, to do the development we have to do the balance and uh, I, at beginning i told you that in sustainability 
we follow three dimension approach we give weightage to environment dimension we give weightage to social dimension but at the same time we give weightage to economic dimension also and without balancing between economy economic dimension social and environment dimension you cannot achieve the sustainable development so i think uh, but yes i also at the same time agree that um, uh, the company oil company have bigger responsibility especially the company like cell where i have also worked it is one of the largest multinational company of world and uh, they should have more responsibility and they should do more work in decarbonization they should do more work to address the climate change situation so that i agree but um, there is a other aspect also we should not go on outrightly criticizing this oil company at the same time we should not go outrightly criticizing the software thank you thank you so much uh, ashutosh you can ask the question oh yeah so well, sir i have a follow up question you talked about balance between the social economic and environmental domain so there is as such uh, there is no measurement or there is no way to quantify these dimensions like economic dimension can be measured in monetary terms while the social and environmental are different so in order to make a balance first my first question is what should be the proportion and how exactly we are going to quantify that uh, social domain is 33% and environmental domain is 26% how do you give that number and how do you quantify uh, the uh, the contribution of those domains ah so there this uh, corporate management of sustainability came in picture and uh, in corporate this is the responsibility of every cso nowadays chief sustainability officer happen and it is the responsibility of a board also to balance between this so how we do i can share with you right now practically how we are doing so every corporate used to identify three four kpi in each dimension so like in environment dimension you can have a kpi to reduce the environment footprint so may you can take target that uh, like at upl we have taken target that by 2025 from 2020 baseline we will reduce uh, carbon 25% we will reduce waste disposal 25% and we will reduce water 20% so like that one kpi you make in environment dimension that how you will reduce your environment footprint so this became short term long term you set science based target like at upl we have set by 2034 we will reduce 64% carbon emission from 20 baseline and long term is by 2040 we will reduce we will achieve carbon neutrality so this is environment then come to the social under social you put kpi like attrition rate you you put that our attrition rate will be not more than 5% or 7% uh you set a target under safety that uh, my lti ifr should be less than 0.5 uh our fatality should be zero uh, so um, that will be on safety just broader i am saying maybe some other kpi can be also set similarly you can set customer satisfaction index that so much is the customer satisfaction index must be there then under eco governance uh, uh, yes there should be economic parameters so those corporate is already doing uh, always become the profitable because if you are not a profitable organization then you cannot sustain so i think like this we we capture the kpi and uh, you try to track those kpi and work in a balanced way you, you, you have to achieve the carbon neutrality also so you, you should pursue the decarbonization plan you have to take care of employee also so safety should not be get compromised attrition rate should be very very low and community should accept your operation wherever you are operating and and the economic aspect is that you should must have profitable 
if your organization is not creating profit, then you cannot sustain. Right. Sir, I just wanted to confirm, is it that uh, we, based on the KPIs in the three domains, we, uh, we make a score for those domains, like uh, we make a score for environment, social and economic, and uh, after that we make a composite score. Is it the way that uh, you're talking about uh, balancing those things and quantifying it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for answering the question. Uh, anyone else has any question? Uh, uh, sir, another question from uh, yeah. 25, um, uh, SM25. Uh, I would like to uh, ask the question that how can we advocate for greater uh, <clears throat> climate financing for, say, the agriculture, chemistry, and forestry industries, uh, considering you just mentioned that uh, such a little financing actually goes towards these uh, industries which uh, contribute to 30% of the carbon emissions. And uh, so, like, what kind of policy should we advocate in corporate forums for, uh, to achieve this particular uh, climate financing goal? Right. So uh, just to correct you, I am not saying that 30% emission happen. I told that uh, today we have a very biggest issue worldwide climate change. And if you want solution of climate change, then forest and agriculture offer 30%, more than 30% solution. They, they don't create the problem, but they offer more than 30% solution. So you can get solution from forest and agriculture for the climate change more than 30%. Now, I told that if you look at the climate finance, today world community is allocating finance to address the climate change. They allocate to the uh, in, uh, this forest and agriculture less than 3%. So I think uh, there they need to increase finance and uh, we feel that the allocation should be approximately 30 percent because 30 percent solution is coming and there is a lot of work can be done uh, in forest and in agriculture especially in agriculture see if, if you see the forest and agriculture then how they are contradicting because uh, today we have pressure of supplying more and more food so it is our stg our stg second stg is zero hunger so that compel to provide food for all and uh, it is possible only by agriculture because 80 percent food comes from the agriculture and when we will enhance the agricultural field then there will be deforestation so what we can do we can increase the productivity we should invest the money on the technology and uh, we should try to increase the productivity such that within the a smaller piece of land we can produce more and more uh, production and at the same time today if you see the loss in the agricultural field there happens to be a loss a lot of loss because of insects because of drought because of several climatic conditions, our uh, agricultural productivity go on decreasing and, and then you require more and more land. So what uh, we should do, we should allocate proper resources such that we can have a good technology, good product which farmer can use and they should produce maximum yield, maximum productivity in a small piece of land, they can produce maximum food. And, and I think by that way, we can offer the solution. So it is very broader area. I cannot explain in just one or two minutes. But just I am giving a hint that, uh, yes, more and more resource allocation is required for the forest and agriculture because they offer more than 30% solution to climate change. Uh, Nilesh, you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, and first of all, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, excuse me for not switching on the camera due to some un unavoidable reasons. So, sir, my question is, uh, 
like you mentioned that uh, we should not be implementing zld for all the plants uh, due to constraints like we ha- it will consume a lot of energy and you uh, definitely proved that with statistics but the other point is you also mentioned that uh, that uh, only like th- 3% of climate finance is going to the agricultural sector and more than 30% is we are getting from it so sir uh, suppose if we are not implementing zld so the consented quantity or the discharge that is going out through the industries will ultimately lead to eutrophication in the land of the areas which or, or the water will be used for the irrigation purposes so ultimately that even if we invest 3% that is of the climate finance in the agriculture sector even that money will be of no use so what will be the parallel between these two situation like how can we tackle this problem right so see here uh, i think uh, uh here also some correction is required uh, this is myth that when we will do the zld then only we will protect the environment from the water pollution i tell you this is myth actually what uh, good practice is that uh, you do the waste water treatment and there is a set a standard that all the pollution load you bring within the a standard discharge limit and then you can discharge there will be no problem and uh, what i told that uh, if you see deep sea discharge facility then uh, our industry which are in the coastal area you can go in gujarat and at bharuch panoli ankleswar jagadia you will find thousands of industry those all are at coastal area and we have very good deep sea discharge system means inside 10 km deep we have developed the pipeline and then we are discharging our waste water there and we are not saying that uh, you send any kind of pollution without treatment we are saying that there is certain standards which has been set scientifically by the government that you bring bod less than 30 you bring cod less than 250 ppm you bring tss less than 100 ppm you should must have neutral ph so there are 10 to 13 parameters you achieve it after treatment and then send to the disposal into deep sea why they are saying that do the zld zld means you are evaporating all the water means you are uh, huge energy consumption happen and huge salt uh, which create load on the landfill sites and also a huge amount of uh, uh, money get invested out of it so capital cost operating cost also happens to increase so techno economically both way it is not uh, good and the feasible practice that i told but however if those area which are land lock area and there is a no disposal facility available then zld is very good and there we should adopt the zld similarly if uh, you have a water scarcity problem and no water is available then zld offer the solution for those thing so our uh, request is this only that don't make mandatory everywhere don't say blindly that zld is mandatory just see the case if it is good then yes make zld mandatory if it is good other way like treat the wastewater dispose it to deep sea and that offered best solution then adopt those practices so so i think uh, this was uh, my narrative of uh, my presentation got it sir thank you so much uh thank you sir uh, it's already 6:15 so if you permit can we take two more questions or yes 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 okay take. so rahul you can ask the question okay thank you thank you sir thank you for delivering the lecture first of all i'm so sorry for not opening camera because of bandwidth issues so my question is related to the agriculture sector sir like we are talking about sustainable agriculture so 
uh, like five days uh, before there was one article like uh, we are procuring wheat from Russia. Even we are using uh, these all fertilizers and we are 140 crore uh, people uh, living in the India. So how we are going to transform from uh, like uh, without using the fertilizer, how we are going to move toward a sustainable agriculture? Because if we are not, because even though we are using these pesticide and all, and still we are struggling to uh, fulfill the needs of our people. So if we uh, gradually want to shift to the organic uh, farming, how, uh, what is going to be the path, sir? how these industry or the government, what is the role of government and the industry in this? Uh, so I think I will not comment that uh, what policy came for China, but yes, uh, broader your question is on organic farming and, uh, and this pesticide. So there, yes, the world community uh, want to move uh, toward a natural farming, organic farming, and uh, that is good also for the health and world community. But at the same time, we have to see that uh, whether that is offering the best solution or no. Because at this moment, uh, our farmers are uh, under pressure. Uh, they have two pressure. One pressure is that they should produce more and more production from same set of land. So they should must have to increase the productivity and yield. So this is one pressure. At the same time, they have economic pressure also because their affordability is also not very high and uh, it is social responsibility of world community also that uh, food is very basic necessity and uh, we should not increase the price so high. So I think uh, we have to see the balance and uh, if we able to produce, if we will able to do more production with the uh, organic farming or natural farming, then that is very good case and that should must be done. But I think uh, it, 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 it's not happen. So why they use fertilizer, they use pesticide uh, to produce to, to enhance the production and yield. So I think here also like sustainability, we have to balance in between. And this is the responsibility of companies also to bring various uh, organic pesticide fertilizer. Like at UPL, what we did in 2019, we did a very big acquisition, Arista. And uh, after Arista acquisition, today UPL has become number one in biological. So we have the pesticide solution, not from the chemical, but from biological. So we have one natural plant protection, NPP, uh, and um, uh, we are offering various solutions uh, naturally. And uh, today we are number one in biological worldwide. So I feel that it is responsibility of companies to look different technology, different innovation and move toward that. But yes, uh, we have to do the balance. We cannot say that day one or we will do only natural farming, only natural um, organic pesticide. We will achieve the sustainable farming. I think it, it's not possible phase wise we have to work and we have to see slowly, slowly that how we can achieve our ways. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Vikas, you can ask the question. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your such, such an informative session. Uh, sir, my question is that uh, uh, as you talk about the sustainable data tracker, so somewhere it's like a, a threat in the future for the sustainable managers. This is my first question. And the second one is, is what kind of skills uh, that we require to uh, if, he, if somebody wants to work at the grassroots level. So uh, from from a, what kind of uh, thing that we should uh, should take into account and what kind of skills we are required. So I think to your first question, there is a no threat of sustainable manager from the software or sustainability data tracker. And I have mm -hmm. well uh, clarified it. 
second thing that what uh, set of people required uh, so i think uh, various there are several area for the sustainability professional they required in government they required uh, in consultancy they required in corporate so everywhere sustainability professionals even ngo also required sustainability professionals uh, even uh, you will surprise the bank uh, bank investors today uh, i used to talk with our investors and when i discuss with uh, investors then i found that they have more experts sustainability experts dinas and you will find a lot of job opportunity in the bank and investing company and they are paying very well also and huge requirement is there in 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 those sector so coming to the skill see for sustainability professionals today market is looking that they should be updated knowledge like i told you that uh, they should be familiar with the sustainability data tracker softwares so they should able to run the software they able to understand how the software can be used to take the data second is they should be very well aware with the ongoing um, environmental issues like global warming uh paris agreement on climate change they should be familiar with decarbonization and sustainability professional required to have a skill to make decarbonization plan yes, because sir. the moment you will land in any company or any organization organization will look on you that uh, how you are going to provide the solution for the all environmental issue and uh, how you will balance between social economic and uh, environmental interest so for sustainability professional one thing is very important that you don't become environment professional there is a difference between environment professional and sustainability professional environment professionals only look one dimension environment dimension and uh, to protect environment they used to implement idea project and all the thought but from sustainability professional we expect that yes environment is very important you should must protect the environment but at the same time you should must have knowledge of social dimension you should must have knowledge of economic dimension and uh, the main criteria in the corporate world today is that we try to assess that whether this person will able to balance between the environment social and economics or no if if you are not able to balance then you are not a sustainability professional so mm -hmm. i think that a skill is very important and um, uh, and also you should link you should link that how even environment and social dimension are beneficial for the company like one example i tell you uh, when uh, i drive the environment footprint reduction inside uh, upl then uh, we set target that we will reduce 30% environment footprint and when we achieve it then everyone was thinking that okay it's socially very good but then i told you no know, it is economically also very good. because when we reduce our water footprint so we save water bill when we reduce carbon emission we saved energy bill when we reduce waste generation we saved waste disposal bill and at upl we achieve when you translate into monetary benefit it was 45 million us dollar saving out of water carbon and waste bill Similarly, when I was at Unilever, and there we decreased fifty percent environment footprint. So in Unilever, we have calculated that hundred million US dollar saving was there out of decrease of water bill, carbon, uh, energy, and the waste bill. So I think sustainability professionals should must have a skill to uh, to propagate all these idea that how environment is beneficial for the business how social acceptability is important 
like one example i can tell you uh, vedanta at tutikorin in tutikorin everything was fine but because of community protest entire unit get shut down now, now you see how social uh, acceptance is very important for the company for becoming sustainable so i think sustainability professional required to have a skill uh, to balance between economic social and environment dimensions thank you so much sir thanks a lot and also very important that tomorrow if you people will go in corporate then you have to convince the management that yes i am going to lead the agenda of environment i am leading the agenda of social but it is not different than your economic interest it is going to feel full your economic interest and when you will able to pursue this to the top management then you will be a successful sustainability professional as well as it will be in the interest of company also it will be in interest of community also thank you thank you so much sir i thank think you. it's time to wrap up the session thank you so on behalf of all the ifm student i would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to you for sparing uh, your preci precious time from your busy schedule to grace this informative event today we had the wonderful opportunity to learn from your experience and i'm sure this is definitely going to help us in our future endeavors we look forward to having more such meaningful interactions with you so once again thank you so much sir for coming thank you thank you thank you so much sir <clears throat> thanks a lot sir thank you thanks a lot dr mrithunjay i mean it being saturday uh, uh, it's a day to relax and you accepted our request and uh, generously you know spent almost close to 1 hour 30 minutes and uh, 30 minutes more than what we had actually you know you know expected and uh, answered all the queries and i'm sure you know he's really given very very nice perspective on you know how the corporates must look at uh, sustainability in a extremely uh, holistic manner uh, in this batch also we have uh, you know a lot of students who actually belong to agriculture background and uh, some of them might have actually got excited to look for interning opportunities with the upl and uh, uh, i would you know only request you that if you could also help us out with that and uh, guide us in terms of you know how do we reach out to upl to seek some of the interning opportunities for these uh, uh, sustainability post graduates uh, that would be very nice of you i mean if you could help us in that direction as well <clears throat> no we will love to have and i think uh, they should send one email i shall forward to our hr and uh, every year uh, we recruit the uh, people in our organization from campuses also and uh, a lot of uh, students are i think from this uh, once i was with uh, iim uh, lucknow noida extension okay. center right. yeah. so we have taken a lot of uh, students in sustainability from there niti mumbai they used to Uh, send several so i think uh, uh, let uh, someone send uh, one email to me i shall forward that to connect to the hr and uh, hr will look into it and uh, we we love to take the point and thank you so much thanks a lot for being with us thank 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 you so much sir thank you sir thank you thank you so much sir thank you.